Sorry, I got to get a little water here before we get started. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the virtual insanity panel. Let me introduce everybody on this. I'm uh, really excited to be able to sit up on stage with these guys. And if you're a fan of anything related to computer gaming, you're definitely going to want to be interested to hear what these guys have to say. So, to my right, of course, John Carmack, technical director of id Software. <laughs> To John's right is Michael A. Brash. He's programmer at Valve Software. That's a big round of applause for a guy who's a current Valve and former id employee. <laughs> yes, and for anyone that isn't aware of it, Michael is my right-hand man through all, the Quake's all of Quake One's development. So much of what came after still has his fingerprints on it. And on the far end is Palmer Lucky, founder of Oculus and maker of the HMD thing, if you've had a chance to experience it over in the exhibit hall. So uh, Palmer's been here for a day. John talked about some of the stuff that we're doing uh, for VR and his opinions on it from, uh, from id standpoint yesterday. But uh, as, our, as a first-time guest to QuakeCon and, and, a, and an honored attendee here, uh, Michael, Perhaps you can go into some of the stuff that Valve's working on, your thoughts, and the directions that you're pursuing there. Okay. Um, so the first thing I'll say is that working on Quake with John was an experience unlike anything else I've ever done in my life. And it's become more so over time because what we did has continued to branch and grow into the future. I mean, this is part of it. It's been, what, it's been 16 years since we shipped Quake. And you people are here, and it's a direct descendant of that. Um, Valve started with that code base. There's this whole community, there's this whole genre of games, there's all kinds of stuff and it's still evolving. <clears throat> and you know, it's an experience everyone should get to have once in their life. So I think that we're at a point where something else like that is about to happen. And I think it's in the area of wearable computing, VR, AR. And uh, I came to this conclusion about a year ago and it's astonishing to me how quickly that is proving to be true and how quickly this is evolving. And, Palmer is the most visible manifestation of this. Um, in fact, yesterday during John's talk, Palmer's Kickstarter went over a million dollars, which I <laughs> thought was pretty appropriate. <clears throat> yeah. So every so often, the hardware just changes in a significant way. And what significant means is that the software can now do things that are novel that you really want to do. And so, in Quake's case, what it really was, was that you could now do persistent servers on the internet, which changed the entire nature of how you could do multiplayer gaming. Um, so here, there are actually a lot of different possibilities with VR and AR. And I initially set out to look into AR specifically, because AR, when it gets here, in its full glory, is really going to change everything. Um, you know, you think and, and Michael, just for those that like distinguish oh, between yeah, virtual sure. reality so and augmented reality. Virtual reality is where all you see is the virtual world. Um, it's as if you were you dropped into you know a game of rage. Um, augmented reality is where you have stuff overlaid onto the real world, and I distinguish that from what I would call just wearable computing in general, where you may see information, like it may show you the time, like your phone does, but. Augmented reality means that it's actually interacting with that, that you see things overlaid on the world like you might see an object in a place where there is no real object. <clears throat> and uh, augmented reality, uh, in the end, I mean, probably most of the people in this room have read science fiction and they know what I'm talking about. It's what we all kind of imagine it being like. And that will be very exciting, and I can tell you that there are a lot of hard problems on the path to that. <clears throat> so progress can be made and there are intermediate steps, and that's all great. But something that I came to realize a little later in that process and that John and Palmer kind of helped me think about a whole lot harder in a hurry is that virtual reality is here now. That it's a, the problems are a subset of the AR problems and the experiences are pretty compelling. And realistically, you know, games are the things that drive adoption of new types of technologies like this. And VR will give great game experiences. And it's pretty obvious what at least some of them are. I bet a lot of you have tried out 
John's demo, and you know, it's a um, great Actually, experience. nobody here has gotten to <coughs> try the real demo yet, yet so ah. they've, what's been running at Palmer's booth is one of the early R&D things holding it up. We moved the demo system that we did all, exactly what we've been showing the press at E3 and yesterday and all day today is going to be down at Palmer's booth tomorrow, so we can let everybody queue through exactly what everybody's been talking about from E3 and the previous demos on there. So if you got a chance to look at what was there, it's a little glimpse of what's set up. It's, it's been kind of a comedy of errors of trying to get all of this, this stuff straightened out right hitting it the ground running at QuakeCon when we show up an hour early trying to integrate all these things and it didn't work out and we had all these things that did not come together at the last minute, which isn't too surprising, but the old faithful demo system that we've been using for all of this is going to be on the floor for everybody to play with tomorrow. So tomorrow you'll all know mm -hmm. that yeah. Yeah, VR is here. <laughs> and, you know, Palmer's rig is not quite in its final form, and so no. it will be better no. than that, right, Palmer? <laughs> it will be better than that. If I... uh, and, but it's, it's a starting point. This is, this is really, this is it. This is the seminal point where there's a reasonable chance that out of this will explode all of the wearable computing gaming stuff that we've been treating as science fiction for so many years. So this seems pretty exciting. It also seems like a great opportunity, and so what we're doing at Valve is we're doing R&D into both AR and VR. And what I can tell you is they both have their challenges. And I think that even VR, which is not as difficult, will continue to evolve for quite some time from this point forward. Wider field of views, better latency and response, um, better tracking, and of course better resolution, but that's pretty far down that list. But there's, and figuring out how to make games great in it. I mean, it's obvious you put a first person shooter in that headset and it'll be good. It's less obvious what kind of games you'll play that you've never played before, what the game elements will be that will be unique, and it'd be really interesting to watch that evolve. But so the question that I'm sure is on a lot of people's minds is, can they expect to see Valve supporting like the Rift, you know, where you've got the post warping and it's not just a standard sort of thing? You know, do you have a champ? Maybe, maybe you need to wait till you get them in your hands to have a champion for that, but is that something that's feasible? Um, so. Now we're treading into Not very to put you on the spot water. or yeah. anything about <laughs> <laughs> unannounced because and unreleased Valve games. It's easy for me to talk about R&D, mm -hmm. and I can't talk about yeah. products. What I can say is that I personally would like to get our games running on the Rift and make it a great experience and then ship it for that. Mm -hmm. I would like to do that. Whether that will be the case, whether it will, you know, we'll be able to make it work that well and whether we'll think the experience is that great, that's not my decision. Yeah. Gabe's cool, I think it'll happen. <laughs> well, let me ask Palmer a question because I, I've seen the lines for waiting for people waiting to try it out, and they really haven't, I think, in, in, you know, gotten the full experience of it uh, in terms of playing Doom 3 BFG on it and how that really sort of augments the experience of the hardware. But I understand you've got, like, the world's largest collection of head-mounted displays and maybe your journey about how you got to here with creating the Rift and sort of how we, uh, you know, got from just as an enthusiast to now uh, a guy who's making head-mounted display VR devices. Well, I've been saying for a while now, as far as I know, I have the largest private collection of head mounts. It's 42 unique units plus some doubles. I'm still looking for the person out there who's going to finally correct me and beat me on that. I'd love to meet them. But, uh, oh gosh. I mean, I've been an electronics and hardware enthusiast for a long time. I've taken apart everything. In, when I was younger, I took apart everything in the house, put apart almost every, put back together almost everything in the house. Um, I got into head-mounted displays because I was a stereoscopic display enthusiast and I had a few different monitors. I had some projector setups, a, a passive one and an active one. And through all that, what, what I really wanted was a great head-mounted display because that's what really seems like the holy grail of stereoscopic 3D displays. The problem was that you couldn't really find anything that was... I mean, th there were good things, but they weren't the things that I wanted. They weren't something that you could actually feel immersed in the game with. And so I decided, oh, well, you know, look at all this. This really, pe people have tried to make VR work before. There's decades of research and f failed companies and some companies that actually did pretty well. I said, well, there's got to be enough information here to make something work, if not for everyone, at least for me. Um, so I started collecting head-mounted displays. I started taking them apart, researching what I could. Um, trying to reverse engineer as, as best I could. And uh, through a long series of events, gosh, I wish I could go through the whole thing and all the different iterations. I've gone through probably like six or seven major revisions of this is the design, this is the one that'll pan out, and then no, no, it's actually not. It's actually this new one, and then it's not that either. And I think that what we have now is actually really close to, the, to something that can provide a really great experience for video games.
So it's worth mentioning how, uh, on the one hand, it sounds like it's almost demeaning the, the effort that went into that, but it's interesting in how elegantly simple the display actually is on there, where people think that head-mounted displays have to be some exotic NASA project on there, but if you, know, if you walked off with one of the rifts and cut it open with a pocket knife, <laughs> you've, got, you've, got a, uh, you know, you've got an LCD panel, a driver board that interfaces to the PC, and you've got some lenses, and it's mounted and packaged, and that's what it takes to make this happen. But each of those things is an important decision on there, where the wrong display doesn't work right, the wrong lenses don't work right. Even if you've got the right display, and I've tried plenty of head mounts now that have really good optical properties in lots of ways, but if it weighs five pounds on your head or it has some other catastrophic ergonomic faculty with it, then that can ruin it all right there. And the, you know, what we've got with the Rift is it's ex it's interesting in that I was heading down almost the same route on there. I was cobbling some things together myself. And when I ran into Palmer, and he had basically built something probably better than I would have done if I had put it together myself. So I'm like, okay, I can abandon working on all of these projects. And this, this is the platform. Because mostly as a software guy, I want something to write software for. It's fun to tinker with the hardware, but I would really just as soon have somebody else do that. And it's only in cases where I can't see someone doing the right thing that I feel the need to try and make something happen myself. So. It, making somebody else, having somebody else go ahead and put that out there and making it available for us to work on is great. And we're, we're very much in line with the things, the steps that still need to be taken, but most importantly, that this is good enough as a base platform to do something now. There's Sp speaking of, yeah. speaking of tinkering, um, we had a conversation uh, yeah. a, a, a month or so ago, and you said that the Rift wasn't for normal people, but <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure that we may have, like, what everybody normal. else's definition of a normal crowd at QuakeCon, who has no, most people don't uh, set up BYOC for 72 hours yeah. and then, you know, have a war of attrition as to who can stay up the longest, but perhaps you can describe, like, what actually the Kickstarter is and what the Rift is and, and why you say it's not for, quote-unquote, normal people. Well, first, I'd like to just really quickly address what Carmack said, where he likes to do software, and he's looking for people to do the hardware. I'm the opposite. I can't do software at all. So it's really amazing to have so many people that are interested in software, interested in a hardware platform, because I can't do that at all, and it's so exciting to see that people are into it. Um, but yeah, I guess that the kind of people that show up to QuakeCon for you know, the BYOC stuff are not what you could call normal people. And I don't know how you define normal, but I guess you could even even divided a little bit into the AR and VR um, possibilities. I mean, AR is something where I think everybody and their grandma is going to see the possibilities and probably could benefit, whereas I think VR, there's a much smaller segment of the population that really wants to strap things on their face and be in a different world as opposed to being in the normal world that they're familiar with but in I'll, a better way. I'll point out that when AR really is full-blown and successful, You'll spend a lot of your time having VR-like experiences. I, t I totally agree. I'm, I'm thinking more, more near term. Yeah. Um, AR has, a, I think AR has a lot more market potential as a mass market thing, like as the next iPhone or the next yeah. whatever. Exactly. The, the, it, it's, a, it, it's a huge platform. Um, so what did you say? Did you explain the, the Rift? And yeah. So in terms of why it's not a consumer device on okay, there, so and, and I do think that things are a little out of control with the number of people that, are, uh, that yeah. are signing up for the Kickstarter because everybody hears, this is awesome, cool, oh, I want one, and it's not for that type of person. It's, uh, I did say at E3 that the QuakeCon crowd is very much the type of people that might want to go try something that's bleeding edge, that's early adopter, that at that point we thought all of them were going to be kits and the type of people that do one of the, you know, the case mod systems on there. I wanted to see at next year's QuakeCon, I want to see 20 different Rift designs of people building their own, uh, you know, different head mounts for it, different ways to get the most comfortable experience for it. That's the type of tinkering that I'm super excited about. The fact that we're going to have 10 times as many people with the, the straight bought kit, there's the fear that people are expecting an out-of-the-box, uh, broad-based consumer experience. Yeah, that's a problem. I mean, we've, we've made pretty clear in the Kickstarter video saying, you know, this is a developer's kit. If you are a developer, do this. You know, this is how you can help. Um, I think the problem is that virtual reality is something that so many people want that when they hear it and they know it can do a good experience and then you have faces on a screen telling them that it actually is good, then they're going to be inclined to throw reason to the wind and end up purchasing one anyways. I mean, it's, it's not going to be one of these duct tape kits. It is going to be a nice finished... The developer's kit is going to be a nice finished product, but it's not going to be something that every average person is going to be able to... 
it's not going to be something that they can justify buying. Right now, there's very little software support. It's, it's going <laughs> to, yes, one game. You know, that, that, you don't buy a headset for one game. Uh, I think there Do are you? a lot of people who would spend $300 to get to play one of John's mm -hmm. games yeah. in VR. You know, the video might... card makers can attest <laughs> to spending a lot of money in the PC guys about like to, to run Quake fast and Doom fast yeah. and Quake 3 fast. Yeah, I th maybe there are those people. I th I, but I'd say for most gamers, it's yeah. not going to be it's not going to be something that they want to spend their money on because developers are going to get their hands on this and there's all kinds of problems and gameplay ideas that once developers have this, they can start tackling those and making experiences. And as those experiences are made, uh, my team can continue to work on making a more polished consumer version of the Rift. That, that, that'll be something people can justify. It'll have more software support. It'll have, you'll have a better idea of what you're actually going to get long term out of it. And I think that that's what people should be excited about. I mean, support, support the idea and in, you know, spreading the word about it. And if you know any developers, of course, you know, lean on them and say, hey, you know, this is really cool. But even if you're a consumer saying, you know, I want to help because I want to support this, so I'll buy one, it's probably better if you, if you don't so that we can get as many units to developers as possible. Yeah, there probably are a number of orders that have gone in like that is that even people going with their eyes wide open, I want to support this, so I'm going to place an order. <laughs> and that's, that's probably not the best thing for people right now. There'll, there will be a better time to express your support uh, in that way. Uh, that's exactly the mm -hmm. case. I mean, it's, a, it's amazing how fast the Kickstarter take, took off. And it'd be really amazing if the entire thing actually was developers, if there were like, what, 5,000 developers <laughs> that all bought this in two days. But more likely, I'd say we're probably looking at a figure in the hundreds to low thousands of actual developers. And then a lot of people that want to either, either A, they're confused about what it is, I hope not, we were very clear, or they just want to experience these, the things that yeah. the developers are making early. So. Yeah, I mean, VR has been talked about since the 60s. Lawnmower Man was the movie. I mean, why haven't we gotten to there? You know, what have been the problems <laughs> to get here? And why, to your point, Michael, as you say, now we're on, you know, the edge of a major breakthrough. Like, what has taken us so long? What have been the problems? And where, why now are we at the point at the hardware and the software sort of combined together to sort of open up the opportunities to, you know, sort of have the, you know, the experience that everybody was told was, told was going to be you know, uh, available 20 years ago if you've been following that long. Well, like what John said, you know, the design is pretty simple. This, some people are saying, oh, this is amazing. You know, the, imagine the advances that you must have made in this field to arrive at this. How come, you know, s such and such big company hasn't done this? And the answer is that it isn't even really me or Oculus or any other VR company that's making this happen. It's much bigger, more massive markets like the cell phone industry and motion controllers and gaming and all these things. And it's because of those advances that have just really pushed forward in these past few years that uh, all of a sudden the technology exists where we can make really good VR platforms just by using that existing technology. I mean, in the past, there's been so many there's been a lot of different v attempts at good VR, and there's all kinds of problems. Some of the headsets were really well designed and lightweight, but they were s low field of view or low resolution. You had some other things using old leap optics stuff, uh, and they provided a very wide, immersive field of view, but they were also things that weighed in the l high single digits to low double digits of pounds on your head, and that's not really something that, you know, we're, we're talking about CRTs here, or, or at least very heavy LCDs with CCFL backlights, and then the computers to drive them weren't really up to the task either. I mean, you're working with SGI workstations and later some of them early gaming hardware, and that was a big deal in the yeah. VR industry. And it wasn't just the computers, it was latency in general. Latency. The, the whole pipeline just couldn't be fast enough. It was from beginning to end. The I mean, trackers, it was 250 milliseconds in the oh, 1990. The, the trackers to the computers to the hardware, every single step of the way, there were big limitations. And maybe if it were just one of those limitations, it could have been overcome. But there were so many chains. I wish I could remember the quote, but um, someone at NASA said that, that VR is one of those holy grail technologies, not because of what can, it can provide, but because it has so many intertwined disciplines that need to be worked on, all of which are high risk and potentially low reward. And they all have to work really, really well. And up to this point, we haven't seen anything that's really been driving mass market adoption of low latency, cheap motion sensors. And then in just these past couple years, we're Although seeing them really come It to is true fruition. that this, this could have happened five years ago. And that's five the, years ago, yeah. the displays were there, the, the MEMS dis, uh, controllers were there. I, it takes somebody deciding to put it all together. It couldn't have happened 10 years ago, but it might have happened at any time in the last five years. It just turns out that we're going to try and make it happen now. 
That's so, what's really interesting. Me, so, one, and, and, and Mike, you, you were, before you were did, you were at Microsoft, and I think that one of the questions that, that's on my mind is, is it, why is it, you know, sort of a guy working in obscurity literally until last, until June, and, you know, and then Doom 3 and John gets put together, and all of a sudden there's a million dollars on Kickstarter. Why hasn't a company that, of the size and scale like Microsoft or, or, or a similar company, IBM, Sony, or whatever, put this stuff together? Why is it the sort of sole inventor that you well, think? So this goes back to the difference between AR and VR. Um, AR, I believe that, I mean, we know Google's doing it, right? I think any of the large companies would be, who have platform plays would be crazy not to be looking really hard at AR because AR is a platform play. But VR isn't. And so if IBM or Sony made a foray into VR, it's not clear what market they would think was worth getting into on the scale that they're talking about. On the other hand, if it's someone like Palmer starting a small company and just seeing if he can generate that excitement, which I think you have the answer to, <clears throat> combined with John, and that's one of the other differences from previous VR forays, is that we have the hardware that's good enough, and we have somebody who can give it credibility and good content immediately. And without that, I mean, we've seen many hardware companies crash and burn on innovation because no software supports it. And here, the software is part of what's driving it. It's a very different dynamic. So I do think there's actually one specific technical issue that was important about this. And the reason the, the headsets in the last decade have not been cool, the number one most important thing was the field of view. And in the... In the high-end systems that delivered the high field of view, they did it with problematic, complicated optics, where they gave themselves the artificial limitation of saying, we have to be able to take a square on the screen and have it come out a square through our optics. And they solved it through impressive optics in many cases. But that limited the systems. When you take that as a given, when you say, this is just one of my axioms that my entire worldview is built on, it restricts the choices that, that are open to you. And what made the Rift really cool is that it's the enormous field of view. It, has, it, doesn't, it doesn't impose too much latency on it, but the, the big thing that matters is the enormous field of view. None of the previous companies were willing to accept that level of distortion in the optics. If you were 20 years ago, you'd be Although people did use leap optics in the really early days, but in the last decade or so on there, the consumer space, everybody wanted the square-edged screen projecting there, and being able to let that go, just having the, you know, the willingness to say, this actually isn't a requirement. You all think it's a requirement, but it's really not. We can go ahead and address this in software, and that makes this possible. It means that you can have this simple solution of a couple lenses in front of a screen, and it still winds up delivering an experience of value. So I do think there's there's historical accident in many ways about just when the right people decide to, to look at it, but there is one important technical decision that I think a lot of companies weren't willing to make. And in many cases, they were held back by their current existing experience base with the government military markets. And if you're, if you're used to writing DARPA uh, contracts and you're going for things like that, they just have a list of specs that they want on there. And they're not saying, give me the best experience. They're saying, give me this, this, and this. What do you bid for it? And you don't have the freedom to go in. I see this a lot in the, in the rest of the aerospace industry where you can't say, what's the right thing to do? It's, these are the only people that are paying for my products right now. Do I make some field of dreams play to go off and do something myself without a software partner? And the companies that are still alive didn't do that. They held on to a small, more mature market that they've been able to deal with. But the, the ability to go ahead and let go that restriction and build around it is, I believe, the critical technical decision here in this generation. I'd like to you know, add to that. It's, you, you're... In the past, one of the things optical engineers, they've looked at head mount office, and like you said, they tried to make it optically correct. And the funny thing is, it's not even so much that we can compensate in distortion for these optics. It's actually that there's even positive characteristics of using, of using a lot of geometric distortion, and that you have more pixels in the center of the image than you do in the periphery of the image. And that's something that, it lets you get away with even lower resolution, and once you get to higher resolution, it still improves the experience. So beyond just saying, oh, well, we can fix this problem in software, it's actually a it's actually a good thing, I think. Part so why didn't the leap, you know, why weren't there more things based on leap optics? Well, there's a few reasons. Um, I mean, the leap optics were really expensive. Even just, I mean, I think a set was, depending on where in the life cycle it was, it was between $6,000 and $3,000. So were, they were fundamentally expensive for their construction? They, no, no, no. The company charged okay. $6,000 to $3,000. Uh -huh. And that's because they were in the VR headset industry. So if you charge $3,000 to $6,000 for the de facto 
high performance lens in the industry, that means you can undercut everyone by three to six thousand dollars and still win the market. So and the amazing thing is that's still going on today. When I was putting together my 120 yes. hertz headset, a company tried to sell me an eight thousand dollar per eye optics setup for a 60 degree field of view. Uh, pass. <laughs> it, yeah, ex exactly. And, um, you know, the other thing about leap optics is back in the day, there wasn't any way to effectively address the distortion. I mean, leap optics were actually originally designed for viewing photo prints that were pre-distorted to, 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 to match the distortion of the lenses. The reason they used them for VR was because there was nothing else that was readily available that you could take with current lens technology. Um, people for, did for those who may not know, like, could, could we define what leap optics oh, yes, are um, as opposed to so, so leap spectacles or okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> magnifying glasses? Um, leap optics are actually, they're, they're, pretty, they're pretty nifty. They're actually some very large uh, 60, millimeter, 60 millimeter eyepiece lenses, and they actually cut them at the nose so that you could really get them in, in your brow really closely. Um, they were a set of high magnification optics that could be used with miniature LCD panels to make VR headsets, and it was a three element, it had three elements. They were just, the innovation in, in the Leap lenses was Eric Howlett, the designer of them, realized, I want to view stereo photo prints with a wide field of view. How can I design a wide field of view lens set? And he came right into the same problems, the distortion. And rather than making a complex lens system, he says, oh, I know, I'll just use regular plano convex lenses, introduce an enormous amount of distortion and chromatic aberration, and then I'll just put a similarly bad lens in front of my camera in the opposite direction. So you get these transparencies of these awful-looking, color-shifted, bowed-out images, and then you view them through the lenses, and all of a sudden, everything looks crystal clear. So when they started using it for VR, there wasn't anyone who was really correcting it. There were people who did some experiments and adjusting the scanning pattern of CRTs so that they would scan in curves and, uh, and try to address it that way, and I don't think that yeah, ever and back out then, even the high-end SGIs would have been very hard-pressed. You didn't have fragment shaders back then. Doing an actual correction would be tough. Exactly, and, it wasn't, and the other problem is, I mean, the resolution was so low that... Um, even a smooth curve was, you know, t tough, to do, tough to do on a lot of these displays. And uh, one of the most successful efforts, actually, at, at, at correcting the leap distortion was, um, was NASA output an image onto a high-resolution monochrome CRT monitor and then took a leap camera with the leap <laughs> lens and then pointed it at the TV and then ran that composite feed back okay, to the Okay, yeah, camera. funny story related to that. I, so I had mentioned that... We dealt with a number of VR companies in the early days, and I generally wasn't all that impressed with them. One of the, the companies that I was not very impressed with had licensed Wolfenstein. Of course, you know, you only had one axis of tracking there, so it's not a really good VR experience anyways. But they had put together their prototype booth, and I was in it, and I'm like, the video quality seems pretty bad on this. What, you know, what are you using to drive this output directly from the PC? Because it, we knew the headset took a composite video input, because they were really taking a lot of like, little TV displays for, uh, to run these things. But I thought, I know there are some PC boards that would take EGA, it was BGA still, it's 256 color, but I knew there were some BGAs that would go out to composite and do a decent job of the signal there. And I was wondering which one they were using because this wasn't doing a good job. And finally they wound up opening up the base and they showed me and there was a VGA monitor with a camcorder pointing at it and that was the signal coming up. I'm like, okay, yeah. <laughs> No wonder the quality is not well, where it should be. We, we had one that was 720p, but it looked really blurry, and mm -hmm. it was really blurry because we output 720p, and they downsampled it to 800 by 600, and then they upsampled it to 720p. Oh, really? <laughs> because, I mean, we've, we've seen a lot of cases of head mounts that will, you know, that will advertise, say, we take 1024 by 768. <laughs> well, okay, you accept a 1024 yes. by 768, but if you resampled 800 by 600, calling yourself a 1024 by 768 display is disingenuous. Well, going back yeah. up doesn't help, I can tell yeah. you that. So it, do you... Do, does, do you guys perceive any sort of competitiveness between sort of just 3D displays like we have with TVs and in movies and things like that as a substitute for VR? Are these things complementary? Does one sort of lead into the other? Is that part of sort of how we've gotten to here in terms I, of stereo? I view them as very different experiences. Immersion is really the key to VR, and you don't get immersion out of those. Yeah, I'm, I'm not, I have not been the biggest backer of the 3D TVs, but the... The benefit is you have to do stereoscopic display to do VR properly, so you get 3D TV essentially for free along the way. It's the, you know, it's half the work to get there, and there are millions of people with 3D TVs, and it's an experience that's, you know, that's interesting. It's not going to be to everyone's flavor, but 
Uh, if you're interested in VR, you stop at 3D TV along the way and you wind up getting it, but it is a, you know, it's a night and day difference for people where you can be kind of, you can, it's neat sometimes to see the 3D TV stuff, but it's not the putting yourself into the world. At most, you're peering through a porthole into the world, which is different than putting yourself in there. Yeah, and I mean, the head-mounted displays have a lot of innate vantage, advantages that no matter how good 3D TVs get, you're not going to be able to solve. I mean, one is the, is the focal plane that you're, you know, the, the plane you're focusing on. With a 3D TV, even if you have the convergence where you're looking at this 3D display, getting independent images, your eyes are still focusing on a display. And this is not so much a problem for TVs as it is for 3D monitors. Um, but that's actually like, still a problem that we said can't that, address yeah. in. So now you're focused at infinity. You, now you're focused at infinity, which, I mean, I guess that now you're focused still focused in one place, but at least you're focused really far away. And what that means is you know, if, if you're looking at something really distant on a 3D monitor, it's really hard to shake that feeling that you're looking at a monitor because your eyes know they're focusing on something several feet away, whereas with a good headset, you can you know, look at something way off in the distance and your eyes are parallel so, and they can focus really far so away. So this is more of a problem in AR, but even in VR, if something's up close, your eyes are going to do vergence and the thing's not going to be focused in the right place. So the problem we're talking about here is that your eyes do stereo vision and they, they come together as things get closer to keep the images overlapped with each other. But the lenses also focus and those are related, but they're not the same thing. And in pretty much all of the head-mounted displays that I'm aware of. The is light, there any exception? There's um, a few research projects, but yeah. nothing, nothing um, even good in research land. So the light is, is, the optics makes the light come from infinity as far as your eye is concerned. So you're always focused at infinity, which is a nice restful place to be. Now imagine you're doing AR and imagine that I replace the label on this with something else. So the label is focused at infinity, and the bottle is focused at one foot away from my face. And what I can tell you happens is, as you shift from one to the other, when you shift from the virtual one at infinity to the real one, um, you actually see your lens focus. You can see things get bigger and smaller and kind of fuzzy, and you're, it's now, just what a camcorder would yeah, do. Yeah, and a way that you can see this in real life, if you're one of the unfortunate people with a, uh, a mirror flat face TV screen on there, if you're watching TV pro programs, you can change your focus and look at what's being reflected in the screen on there as very much bringing one or the other into focus. And this was something that I didn't appreciate uh, enough until... I spent some of this time this year working in the virtual worlds where I would have my, I'd be in the virtual world like in the cafeteria in Mars City on Doom, looking down at the table and looking at the ground below, and then I'd take off the goggles and look at my desk and the ground below and appreciate much more how, how much you change your focus as you're looking from one point to the other. And I don't think we're getting this solved anytime real soon. This is one of those, it'll be great when we get it, we can get by without it. Uh, it's also interesting the fact that most people, uh, when you're nearsighted or farsighted, and there's different things with your, with your eyes where people will have a natural resting focus at different places, but in general, very few people have a natural resting focus the distance their monitors are from them. So there are interesting possibilities that it may, we need more resolution obviously, but it may be possible that even a more comfortable productivity working environment uses collimating optics in some degree, you know, in some degree where you might have a virtual experience that could be less eye strain if you're going to look at a monitor for 10 hours. You know, I don't and, think we're... Mm. And when I said that, you know, in the future where this all converges, that VR will be how you spend a lot of your time, I mean, you don't want to use AR sitting at your desk, right? What would be the point? But yes, if you could have virtual screens plastered around you, if you could just have debuggers hanging up here, um, and as you say, if you could be focused at a restful distance, that's pretty interesting. You know, one of the interesting things talking about uh, like virtual desktops on there is that uh, one of the problems that we fight with the, uh, with the, the head tracking and everything now is jitter and sampling issues that are largely related to solving the harder problem of position, where if you went to the case of you're just going to deal with a spherical globe effectively at infinity, a large fraction of those problems go away, and you could even go ahead and let your gyros just drift, and maybe occasionally you have to twist the world to correct manually for the drift on there, but you could have an absolutely rock-solid display with exactly what we've got today. There are zero changes that are needed to make that happen, and you get your inside-out tracking so you can swing your globe around and stretch so and pinch We and should tap explain and, this yeah. one since... So, Sorry. <laughs> one of the really hard problems for both VR and AR is where am I and what's my orientation? And you say, well, how hard could that be? And uh, the answer is it turns out to be pretty darn hard. 
The way that your body does it is you have three canals in your ear that give you rotations, and you basically largely use your eyes to correct that um, and to tell where you actually are, and you have proprioception also for location. Replicating all that stuff is hard. So we can use an IMU, we can use a gyro in that to track orientation. That works pretty well, but it does drift over relatively long periods of time, right? So you have to correct it for real at some point. And the question is, how do you correct it for real? Do you use optical tracking and do processing and with that? When you say drift, it, we're talking about the world shifts left So, right. like, you start off looking like this, but as you've gone around a little bit, then all of a sudden the world's 20 degrees off. And you're like, okay, why is it stuck sideways like this? Because the, the gyro isn't integrated. Uh, they've drifted in that way. You don't notice if it drifts in yaw because you're just turning around a little bit, but you notice very much in any of the tilting orientations. Exactly, and in terms of location as opposed to rotation, it's actually considerably harder because there you're getting acceleration and you integrate it to get velocity and then you integrate it to get position and after 30 seconds, you're just whipping around. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't even take that. That was one of the first things I did at Armadillo was trying to use, when we're trying to do our hovering rocket vehicles on there was, well, can we just, we've got accelerometers, mathematically you integrate this twice, you've got position, you track it all around and that's where theory diverges from reality quite rapidly and you do find yourself flying towards Mars when you should be sitting there. All you need is plane. infinite precision accelerometers, yeah. right? That'll be the try. Let me ask a, a much lower level question, which is, is you guys are both wearing glasses, I wear contacts. I think lower level means something different to you than it does to us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, lower level of sophistication. Okay. Perhaps I should add two last words. So. Uh, it, when you when you put the when you put the headset on, you take your glasses off. I wear contacts. Uh, I can't see very well up close, especially not right here. I can't see anything on my hand. But when I put the head mount on, everything's fine. Is that the lenses? It's How the do you adjust for focus? In, the light's I mean, coming from infinity. But 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 then everybody uh, has a different level of astigmatism or eye perception or all so of that. I was going to ask you yeah. this. So it's a really tough question. People say, "I wear glasses. Can I wear a head mount with the glasses?" And the right answer is. There's other ways to solve it without wearing glasses. I mean, it's a fundamental, it's not a, it's not a problem you can solve with clever design all that much, at least not using, you know, conventional optics and displays. I mean, if you try holding up your thumb, come on, humor me, hold up your thumb in front of your eye. Now hold it really, really close till it's brushing your eyelash. Okay, you can see that's pretty huge. Now imagine you're wearing glasses and just move it an inch out because you need enough room to not scratch the lenses. Oh, look it, it's itty bitty now. You're cutting your field of view massively down, and so it's hard to make something that'll work with glasses. So there's a few ways to correct for that. The, I mean, there are some of those head mounts that have the enormous lenses with, on there. They're either, yes, uh, the Fake Space Wide 5 yeah. has enormous lenses and a decent eye relief. A lot of low field of view head mounts, they just have really long eye relief, mm -hmm. of course, very small field of view, because that's just, they're, they're accepting that compromise. Um, I mean, the easy cop-out is to say wear contacts, and that, 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 that fixes it, I guess. But there is interesting, but th some of the stuff we can correct with focusing on there, it's important not to have moving parts in the first step yes, out there, but see, I'm the thing excited is, to see People are saying, advances. you know, will this work with my, with my, can I use this if I'm nearsighted? Okay, I'm nearsighted, um, so I'm not wearing glasses right now, but I am a, I'm reasonably nearsighted, and so for me, it's really important to have this working for me because I don't want to put on contacts. I hate contacts. I lose them. Uh, there's a few ways to correct in hardware. You can have adjustable diopter where you can adjust very, very slightly the, different, the di distance between the lens and the uh, display, and then you, get different, you, can, get di you can get different... Uh, different focusing distances. So if you can only focus on things up close, you can move it into your range. Another potential way to use it would be to use um, lens inserts that perhaps slightly correct diopter that you can slide in front of the main lens. And we're looking at all of those, but for the developer's kit, we're probably not going to be able to do that just because the goal is to get something that's mechanically rock solid, put together really well, and gets the core technology in the hands of developers as soon as possible. And I do tell people that it's only 640 by 800 per eye. You don't need full visual acuity for this right now. I have crummy vision, but you know I spend an hour playing the game, you know, playing the time inside there, and it works and, out and, okay. and so your recommendation for the way the Rift works is when people get to check it out tomorrow is they would take their glasses off. Yes, you have to. You, you pr there were some people trying it with glasses, but I would very much recommend that you use it with your, with your glasses off. And if you really can't see it at all because you're extremely nearsighted or there's, some other, there's some, something like an astigmatism that can only be corrected by your glasses, then try that. Yeah, because you can't, but the main thing is it cuts it from this awesome, amazing 90 degree field of view down to 50 degrees if you step it off. And it changes so the distortion, the distortion yeah. characteristics of the display as well. So mm. it, it, it's not something I would use with glasses. 
Well, we're, uh, we're at about 10 minutes till the end of the panel. I thought we might want to take some questions for the audience, unless you guys have anything last that we ought to get into. Michael, I don't know. Well, I'll mention one other thing, which is what Palmer's going to ship is going to be the beginning. And when we look back in five years or 10 years, it's going to be pretty crude, right, Palmer? I hope Palmer? so. Yes. I hope so. But what John and I first shipped was 320 by 200. People forget this when you look back at, if you go back and you have fond memories of Doom or Quake on there, you know, it's all smoothed out and nicely anti-aliased in your memory. <laughs> if you go and boot that old computer back up and run the game there, and you, you have these, uh, somebody called them bathroom tile sized pixels staring you in the face, blinking on and off. And it was still awesome back then. It was showing people something that they hadn't seen before. So. You know, we're not at the point where people have to compromise that much uh, looking at this now. It's, but it is going to get much better fairly rapidly. I mean, I think there will be generations happening in the following year after this goes out. I, I absolutely agree. And I'll also point out, so do you remember how many polygons there were in a typical quake scene? Total, so, including the including Well, the, the characters monsters. had 100 to 200 triangles or so in there. and They had 50 to 100. Yeah, the, the world polygons. No, no, the, the characters themselves visible yeah. were 50 to 100. I so, think that was a little Yeah, remember the little paper quake guy that sat on your desk for yeah, a Yeah, the, the origami quake, the, origami shambler. There were yeah. typically less than 1,000 yeah. polygons in yeah, view. Yeah, total, almost always. And you know, it, your brain just took care of that. It just has to get past a certain threshold, and I think Palmer's gotten it to that threshold. The threshold is, you know, it, it, lots of previous VR hardware and, you know, a normal keyboard mouse setup is that you're very much controlling a scene with, with input devices, and your brain knows that. There's a certain threshold you cross with all kinds of things, tracking latency, field of view, and resolution, which I think has been crossed, where you feel like you're actually inside of the scene and where things are in the right place. And that really triggers something in your brain. Now, of course, you're not going to have the lightning-fast superhuman reflexes that you can achieve with a keyboard and mouse, but I, I think that being immersed in the game is, is a really powerful experience. Which, which reminds me of the other. you know, the Razer Hydra, or all those different things, developers can, you know, try all different kinds of gameplay using them. But I do think one of, the, one of the very likely evolutions of form factor for this would be you put all the guts of the stuff into something that you hold in your hands, whether it's a weapon, uh, and whether you have like a little telephone cable or it's near field, uh, high bandwidth communications or something like that, but you get all the weight of the driver boards and the, uh, uh, the batteries and whatever you've got into there. Something you want your weapon to have some heft if you're carrying it around in a weapon-oriented game there. But being able to take your weapon and hold it up and do this, do present arms in virtual reality, that, that's going to be just awesome. I've actually done that to a degree. Yeah. I actually have a, a pretty heavy metal-bodied airsoft gun with a solenoid-based recoil system in it. And it works, it works pretty well, of course. The reality is that after play, you're not going to be picking up a you know, 10-pound weapon with, with actual real heft to it and say, oh yeah, I'm going to go out and I'm going to play play uh, whatever game for 10 hours, most of us are not actually suited to that. Or <laughs> anything, uh, you know, people are saying to me, they're saying, oh, you know, um, this isn't going to be able to simulate a realistic combat experience until you, the display weighs at least less than 100 grams. I'm like, you mean a realistic combat experience where you're wearing a seven pound Kevlar helmet on your head? Yeah. I, most of us are not cut out anywhere close to what the people who do real combat are. So, you know, there's always, always compromises. Maybe a really lightweight gun, arcade mm -hmm. gun. <laughs> so, so it will be really exciting, though, because input, displays, software, tracking, all these things are going to rapidly get better. And we've got it all here at QuakeCon 2012, guys. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I feel like I'm literally getting smarter just by osmosis and proximity <laughs> to the people on this stage with. We've got a microphone here in the back there, if, I, if I'm focused correctly. If you guys have some questions from the audience, I just ask you to sort of queue up in an organized fashion. I don't think you're getting another opportunity to talk uh, to the likes of Mike and John and Palmer here <laughs> in, in, in the foreseeable future. So I would encourage you to do so if you're curious about these things. Uh, okay. Hi. Uh, I had a question about software development using VR to visualize what you build. And maybe even the concept of using this for training in high risk scenarios without there having to be any risk to life. So you probably have some. I, um, yeah, I've actually worked at the Institute for Creative Technology and the Mixed Reality Lab for quite some time. It's an Army affiliated research center. And that's actually exactly what they do is they research using, it's one of many centers across the United States that are using Army funding to research 
all kinds of things, post-traumatic stress disorder treatment, putting people into high-risk scenarios that are either too risky, impossible, or even just too high cost to simulate in real life. Um, and you also can change all the variables a lot more tightly than you would in, in a real life situation. It's not something that you know, we're focusing on, but that's why we want to get this to developers so that they can you know, see what they can put together with a high field of view immersive headset. And I think that there's, we already have people that have been researching that and not even researching, actually deploying some of these systems. But it's worth mentioning again that even in the money isn't, money isn't so expensive world of military contracting stuff on there, very expensive head mounts, in many ways they don't deliver the experience that the Rift does, even when you've spent <laughs> many, you know, a couple orders of magnitude more money. In fact, I, totally I have. Yeah. I mean, we have a $17,000 head mount display with actually slightly more horizontal field of view, and it is not as good an experience. And it's achieving... That's quite a bargain. $300 yeah. beats 17000 That's. Yeah. A... <laughs> I mean, I've worked with a lot of really expensive head mounts. I actually have ones in my collection that were originally $97,000, but they were, they're, of course, worth much less now as, as relics. <laughs> but, um, I mean, I've even using modern head mounts priced in the $35,000 range, and I've, not to, not to brag, but I'm bragging, is people have seen direct comparisons of that display versus yeah. not the Rift, but prototypes I've made that are pretty similar, and they've chosen the Rift Yeah, and they would fixate on the resolution, saying, but my God, there's more pixels. Why oh, isn't yeah, it better? <laughs> yeah, he's, I mean, uh, you know, Carmack mentioned that a lot of these companies are trying to deliver a checklist on a box. They, these companies, they... And, some of these companies are great. It's amazing what they accomplish. It really is. I was but really impressed. I, I didn't know a lot of these optics technologies existed a year ago. They're, they're, they sound like stuff out of sci-fi when you're reading off of you know, their, 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 grant, their, their papers. Um, but their goal is to you know, fill those check boxes. It's not, it's not to say, well, this provides a better experience. Like, no, no, no. We want SXGA resolution because that's what all of our legacy systems work with and, work with, and we believe that that's the minimum that you can use. Um, and, you know, a lot of these head mounts are great, but they're expensive. They've got a great market. Why would they want to, you know, foray into the consumer market where the margins are lower and the risk is higher? Um, it's going to be hard to sell the $17,000 display after you've sold the $300. Especially if you're going to them and you say, if they, let's say that they copy this, you know, it's like, why haven't people done that? I'm sure there's people who could, could have done this, established companies, but what are they going to do? Go to the army and say, hey, we have a display that's, you know, half the resolution of the last one we made for you, but we promise it's a better experience. They're not going to have a very easy time selling that. Just out of curiosity, for $300, based on what you guys have heard today, raise your hand if you would be interested in participating in the Kickstarter, just out here. So Are you a developer? That... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we have another question? Yeah. Uh, so first, uh, I remember last year during one of your talks, John, uh, I mentioned uh, some question about VR and separating the, the free look component from the, the gun site, and that was thought as just, you know, something wildly into the future. So I want to thank you for doing what you always do, which is to uh, take people's sci-fi dreams and bring them closer <laughs> to reality. You're good at that. Uh, sure. But uh, the, the question is whether Doom uh, 3 Tech, uh, Id Tech 4, uh, since it was used for uh, this, uh, would be useful for all the things that used id tech for. Uh, in other words, can all the other games that are based on that be easily translated to this tech, I mean, to the so VR? we've got the, my best case for this was I was hoping that I, we'd be able to open source everything right after shipping because all the original Doom 3 code is open sourced and anybody would be able to pick and choose whatever they want. It turned out we wound up pulling over a lot more bits of Tech 5, various parts of the math stuff, all this, uh, the, the external uh, framework around a lot of it. And in hindsight, we would have been better off development-wise to have put Doom 3 inside of, uh, inside of uh, Rage rather than to try and just piecemeal do what we did. But as it stands, I don't know exactly what's going to happen right now. Um, we're going to do something. Uh, it would be ridiculous to have a completely closed case of this after we had the other things open source. But whether it's a matter of we open source everything with stripping out the console stuff we can't release and just allowing more Tech 5 stuff to be open sourced, or maybe more likely, probably, we, uh, we wind up saying the, pe the parts people want to mess with, the game code and then the input code from the head tracking stuff, we release those and just have the rest of it as, uh, as OBJ files that get linked against. We'll figure something out on that. Uh, it's not an optimal situation, but that's just kind of how it, how it worked out. 
Next one question. Of the, oh. One of the things you mentioned was uh, that with AR, with VR, we would get 3D stereoscopic and all that, all, just kind of along the way. One of the things with current stereoscopic TVs is it assumes pretty much near perfect stereoscopic vision. Uh, I unfortunately have a lazy eye, so my stereoscopic vision isn't really there entirely. Uh, my my brain kind of compensates, so with TVs or 3D movies, I don't get any of the benefit. Actually, if anything, I get a headache out of the experience. Can I take uh, this on, John? Sure. One of the things so, you was one of the, one of the things with just generally poor eyesight. You mentioned that the devices could have built-in lenses. Is there anything to kind of compensate for that shift in stereoscopic vision? So stereoscopic vision is surprisingly unimportant yeah. mm -hmm. in this experience. Parallax is a far more important cue. Um, depth cues, you know, like sizes of things and overlapping, those all matter more. And I think that the first time you use a VR headset that does good location tracking as well as rotation, you will be shocked at how unimportant stereoscopic vision is. Going like this, just rocking from side to side, tells you way more than stereoscopy. I would totally trade uh, stereoscopy for accurate position tracking in a heartbeat, having a mono screen. I trade a number of things together to wind up getting really accurate low latency position tracking on there. Uh, stereo TV, 3D TV, is kind of a weird thing where it's adding something that in many cases isn't all that important and sometimes the content's trying to amp up the value of it there. It's something that can be added because it's convenient and possible there. It doesn't mean it's actually the most important thing or even a terribly important thing in general there. So it's not that important whether you've got, uh, if you just do the same, like some of the things that Palmer's got other people working on is taking ways to hack other games to just play inside this, put the distortion on there. And even if you're just taking the same image monoscopically and projecting it onto there, the immersion that you get there is still you know, really significant. Just from the wide field of view alone is, 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 a, is a huge thing to add to that too. So it should be much less stressful than looking at a 3D TV because if one eye is not paying attention, then it just doesn't matter because it's, it's got its own field of view. There's no challenging focusing problem on there. And uh, that is the one, one aspect where the Sony head-mounted display, it does, while it has all of these issues as a head-mounted display, it had a number of very positive things with it, especially at its price point when it was introduced relative to everything else. But as a 3D movie viewer, it, uh, it has the real advantage over 3D TVs of you have zero crosstalk, which is something that is still, with the very best of displays, problematic, where the glasses just don't go 100% opaque, and that bugs me a fair amount. The very best of them now are pretty good, bad ones are really bad. I, so 3D TV is still a mixed blessing. Thank you. Next question. I, I got a chance to get out today and use the headset, and the immersion was great. The field of view made it very amazing. But using the controller with it, and it was awkward because I'm used to using the right stick to look around, whereas I was now using my head. How do you see the control, the head, the headset actually changing the control interface, basically? So well, one of the important things that worked out great in all of this is that the, when you play the real game with this and it's strapped onto your head, and I was, it was a little bit dubious about, we wanted to have something showing at the Oculus booth, so we wound up showing something, but it's not the, the experience that you get with the real demo system tomorrow with the headset strapped onto your head so it's tracking your head on there, that's what you want. And you can play it. You can stand as still as a statue and play it just like a console game, running around, moving, and aiming the gun up and down without changing your view on there. But you get the more benefit when you just relax a little bit and loosen up and allow your head to, to just track around wherever it wants to go. You, have, you can play it with a mouse even if you want to, if you want to have the whip turns on your yaw. It's probably not the best VR experience for that, where I encourage most of the people that we've been showing it to to stand, even though, even though you can't crouch or hop sideways or anything like that with the sensors that we're using, it's still... I, you know, it still gives you that little sense of being there, but you can sit down and play with con existing controls if you want. It is a hard problem to say what you want to be able to do is walk around, and that will be solvable in the not too distant future where you can have at least a cleared space and physically walk around. I am interested but remain skeptical and unconvinced of anybody's crazy ideas to let you think that you're walking around in general and having that real body experience without taking up a lot of space. There's some interesting gerbil ball things that people can get into and roll around on rollers that I think well, we should get one of those for QuakeCon. Uh, we, we should do this. Then uh, again, maybe not. Okay. No, I, I'm serious. We should. 
There's a lot of cr yeah. There's a, there's a lot of crazy schemes. The problem yeah. is that any kind of heavy-duty locomotion platform is going to be really expensive because a lot dangerous. of dangerous. <laughs> you know, <laughs> liability. Yes. I mean, the thing is, a lot of things have dropped in price, but what has not dropped in price over the past forever has been industrial machinery relative to the rest of the market. Making big things that move heavy things well is not is not something that has gotten very much cheaper. They are telling me, due to the panel uh, uh, or the presentation after us, that we've got time for one more question after this one. So uh, let me get one more question in from the audience. Hi. Um, so with all this new technology, hardware, software, um, do you feel that, um, oh man, this mic is, uh, do you feel like you've gotten any new game mechanics out of it? Or are you guys just satisfied as like Bethesda, id, king of the first person, let's make our technology just make first person awesome. So I was, when I first started doing this, I thought that there's the obvious first person shooter connection where virtual reality seems tailor made for what you do in an FPS game. But once I got some time to play around with it, I think it's a lot broader than that, where I think that anything that you're doing, any game that has a 3D camera view, whether it's a third person game or a god game or anything looking down there, even if you're just looking down at your little toys that you're moving around in some way, it benefits a lot from cutting off the real world and have the subtle head motions and everything there. So I think it's going to have really broad appeal. And then I think all of the interesting stuff will happen interface-wise when you have inside out cameras and you're looking at gestural based stuff when you can go ahead and start figuring out what in space gestures and things you want to do, which you see a little bit of people trying to do that with Kinect and it works very badly for a number of reasons there. But with, with higher fidelity and very low latency and having digit like stuff, there's going to be all sorts of cool stuff. What we don't have is the tactile feedback. You want to be able to pick up and manipulate things there. So it's still going to be wizardly sorcerer gestures going on, but it'll still be fun to do. So um, speaking of games, uh, how long till we get, we've got Doom 3 BFG that works with VR and people uh, obviously resonates with them. How long to 5, 10, 100 games are supporting this? Well, I, there's going to be hundreds of developers that get this stuff, and I think every company that gets one will have a champion. And depending on where they're positioned in the company, uh, whether it can be, you're not going to make a ton more money from this, but it's still justified as a PR device because that's going to be a secret weapon for Doom 4 showing when we're showing to, to press and people. We do our presentation, we wow them with everything, then we put them in virtual reality to play the same experience and they will not forget that. And I think that's going to be valuable. And I think that's the way I pitch it to other developers. You're going to want to do this. You can probably convince your boss that it's a good idea to do this by looking at the feedback that other people will be getting from presentations like this. A any final remarks, Michael Palmer? Pretty exciting time to be in this business. So when do we get to, to, to play Lawnmower Man, experience the holodeck, or live in the Matrix? <laughs> so it's going to be, you know, that it's going to be pretty close in a lot of ways. You, you put this on, you see the virtual world, you walk around in it, and then it's quickly going to, it's going to become the content problem, just like we saw in all of the pre, you know, existing stuff that we're doing. You can repurpose a lot of this, but when people start designing for VR, doing things that, that really cater specifically to it, it'll follow the same trajectory that we've seen in mobile, where there's a couple years of really innovative stuff, everybody trying things, little garage shops getting famous and rich, and, uh, but then it's going to be professionalized, and the big studios will come in, and there will be AAA-directed stuff for all of this. And, it's, uh, and it will follow a lovely path through all of that. And I, th I think it will branch out beyond our action games. Uh, I think that there will be a lot of people. There were all these visions in the 90s about what VR was going to be. And I, in many cases, denigrate all the, the starry-eyed, head-in-the-clouds visionary talking about how this is going to change everything and how wonderful it's going to be because they weren't focusing on the, the wrenches that they need to apply to the right bolts there. But now that all of this actually is happening, the dreamers can come back out and they can make something happen the way the web happened, where you didn't have to be hardcore low-level programmer to make something amazing on the web. And we, we're going to solve all those hardcore low-level problems here in the coming years, and then it will be the creative market again in that way. It's interesting when you say it's a content problem, because I have um, walked around games and some things look amazing and some things look ridiculous. <laughs> they look like they were cut out of cardboard and pasted up there because it wasn't authored for this. And it's not as simple as just saying, oh, these games now run in a head-mount head display, let alone what makes it a good experience. Mm -hmm. The other thing is that I've also looked at, as you say, like, you know, God games, mm -hmm. and it is a better experience. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, you can bend down there, things suddenly look, but you also have to make everything look good when you get mm -hmm. up close. I mean, so there's, there'll, as John says, there'll be a period of figuring all this out. Well, like in the Rage demo, one thing in particular, you know, something looks, some things look great, and there are things you wouldn't expect. A lot of people were, I was pointing this out to them, and my girlfriend keeps making fun of me for pointing it out, and it's like, look at the bricks, look at those bricks, and there's some bricks knocked out of the wall, and those are perhaps the most interesting thing in the whole demo to look at, because there are all these, all these different cubes all together at different depths, and you can go, and you can, you know, stray from side to side, and you can see such, so, such intricate parallax effects, you know, as you go across the bricks, and just stuff like that is something that you would, I'm sure, never really consider in an FPS. How can we make it look really, really, how can we make those bricks look really good? It's going good? to be wonderful that we have so much majestic artwork in the game that people just fly right by. You, know, you just drive right by it because it's too much trouble to want to spin your thumb over there and go over and take a look at it. But when you're walking around, your, your brain just naturally goes and twitches at something and you make a decision in 50 milliseconds about whether it's of interest to you and you just naturally look over at things and that works so much better than commanding your hand to go tell the game controller to tell the game to go look at something that was kind of interesting. So in many ways there's a lot of hidden value already in some of the lushly textured and built out worlds that will be rediscovered like this. I mean, I made the games and I spent so much time in that little chunk of a rage level looking around at all of this wonderfully cool stuff. So it's, it's interesting in that regard. I'm sure the artists will yeah. be happy <laughs> that their art is being experienced more indirectly. Well, thank you, everyone. I, it's been an amazing panel. That's all, all the time we have for this afternoon. I hope you enjoyed it. And, uh, yeah, give them a big round of applause. Thanks, guys, a lot. It was really interesting to sit here and just be a part of it. Thank you.